the sacred assembly of the Passover has come. Today, let us take some time to share the Word of God together with the sermon titled, The Passover and God's Family. When we first consider the matter of our souls, we come to realize that we once lived a truly glorious life with God in the Kingdom of Heaven. However, when viewed according to the teachings of the Bible, we are the angels who committed sins in heaven, being deceived and entrapped by the wicked schemes orchestrated by Satan. Consequently, we were cast down to this earth. All human beings living on the earth are sinners who are expelled from the kingdom of heaven. In order to grant them the forgiveness of sins and bring them back to the eternal heavenly home, God came to this earth and established the truth of the new covenant Passover. Therefore, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven without keeping the Passover. It is for this reason that today, as members of the heavenly family, we will carefully study the Bible and examine the teachings about the Passover, where God promised the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. First, reflecting on the title of today's sermon, the Passover and God's family. Let us confirm whether or not we are members of God's family. Many people think that God the Father is just a title, similar to how they address a teacher in school or a professor in college. However, it is not merely a title. There is an actual relationship between God the Father and His children. The testimony of Jesus Christ, along with all the prophets, can be seen throughout the Bible. They testify to the amazing truth that we are the children of God the Father, who is in heaven. Many people are unaware of how significant and honorable it is to become a child of God, as well as the role and responsibility it entails. Due to this lack of awareness, although we share the good news about the precious blessing of becoming a child of God, People in the world perceive it merely as a doctrine. What we preach is, in fact, the absolute truth. We are informing them of how the truth really is. Since God is our Father, we preach that God is our Father. Since we are God's children, we enlighten others to our true identity as the children of God Almighty. Let us confirm this matter together through the Bible. First, let us confirm the relationship that exists between heaven and earth through the book of Hebrews chapter 8. In Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5, it is written, They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Not only was the sanctuary in the Old Testament modeled after the one in heaven, but also the world we live in today is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Among them, since the title of today's sermon is The Passover and God's Family, let us confirm this matter through the Bible. Is the family system that originally existed in heaven accurately reflected on this earth? We must believe in all the teachings recorded in the Bible. Since we cannot observe the world of microorganisms with our naked eye, what kind of tool do we use in order to do so? We use a microscope. Through a microscope, these tiny beings become readily visible. Now, would anybody claim that bacteria, amoeba, or germs don't exist because they're only seen through a microscope? I must surely be fake because I'm not able to see it with my own eyes. Is there anyone who would make this claim? Of course not. Likewise, through what kind of microscope can we observe the spiritual world? We should examine it through the microscope called the Bible. If we believe everything that appears under a microscope, but cannot believe the matters of the spiritual world that the Bible testifies about, wouldn't that be inconsistent? 
The Bible teaches us that the earthly sanctuary, as well as the family system, is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Hence, let us confirm whether the things of the earth align with those of heaven by examining the teachings in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. We must believe in the spiritual world that the Bible testifies about. Since it is not visible to the naked eye, many may mistakenly think, there is no spiritual world, and so God must not exist either. Many people commit the foolishness of thinking like this. Everyone, let us take a close look at the scene that God has revealed to us through the Bible, which is our spiritual microscope. Chapter 12, verse 9. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to who? The Father of spirits and live. Among the family system on this earth, there is a father. Similarly, who exists in the spiritual world, the kingdom of heaven? It is said that there is a father of spirits. Let's move on to Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, Jesus said, Do not be like them, for who knows? Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray, Our Father in heaven. Jesus Himself instructed us on how we should pray, even telling us the words we should use. Whom do our spirits have? We have the Father of our spirits. This is an absolute truth. Through the Bible, God is giving us the spiritual realization that God is indeed our spiritual Father. Now, if a man is a father, who is it that can address him as Father? who must also exist. There are many male adults here, yet merely being in one's forties or fifties does not automatically make someone a father. Who must be there? There must be his children. It is only then that he can actually be addressed as a father. Let's take a look at the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 6. 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 17. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be, who will God be to us? A father to you. And you will be, who will we be to God? My sons and daughters. Who is it that spoke these words? Let's continue to read. Who said these words? Says the Lord Almighty. God declared, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. In other words, you will be my children. This is what God said. These are not the words of just anyone, but these are the words spoken by God Himself, which were recorded verbatim in the Bible. Just as the Father, Son, and Daughter exist on this earth, there is undoubtedly God the Father and His sons and daughters in heaven, the spiritual world. This is not the end of this relationship. Among the family members on this earth, isn't there also a mother? Then must there not be someone in the spiritual world as well? Only then would it be logically consistent to say that earthly things are a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above, above here indicates heaven. Therefore the Jerusalem that is in heaven is free, and she is. Who is she? Our mother. This mother does not refer to our physical mother. Instead, the Bible informs us that the Jerusalem that is above, in other words, in heaven, is free, and she is our mother. The Bible also awakens us to the fact that there is a spiritual father, spiritual sons and daughters, and even a spiritual mother, that is heavenly mother, who grants us spiritual life. 
God has revealed it to us that just as there is a physical family on this earth, there is a spiritual family in heaven. What do family members have in common? They share the same blood. Therefore, when discussing the family system, we cannot overlook the significance of this relationship being bound by blood. As the saying goes, blood is thicker than water. Even when siblings quarrel, not long after they play, talk, share food, and smile at one another. This unbreakable bond exists because they are part of the same family. On the other hand, however, if there is a quarrel or a problem between people who are not related by blood, it is generally a bit difficult to solve. This is the case of those who are not blood-related. Then what about the spiritual family? They are spiritually related by blood. What regulation of the truth did God establish on this earth so that we won't forget this? The Passover. Therefore, the truth of the Passover can be established only with blood, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The Bible continuously testifies about this matter with verses such as, Without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Everything be cleansed with blood, and have been brought near by the blood. God allowed numerous animal sacrifices and correlated the shedding of blood with redemption. That is why when God calls out the people of heaven, He reminds them by saying, Whoever wants to receive the forgiveness of sins must return to the New Covenant Passover. Thus the Passover is a truth that can only be observed by God's family and not by anyone else. Even if they do not possess extensive knowledge of the Bible, they realize it and say, the Passover is the Word of God in the Bible. I believe that those who are here today have been granted by God the eyes that can see, the ears that can hear, and the hearts that can understand. Therefore, none of us should lose this glorious path. All of us should strive to enter the Kingdom of Heaven. Then let us find out how a spiritual blood relationship can be established through the Passover by turning to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 53. Let's see verse 53. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. When someone has no life in him, doesn't it indicate that he is dead? The Bible teaches us that those who do not have Christ's flesh and His blood in them are all considered as being dead. Verse 54, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has, what do they have? Eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Whoever eats Christ's flesh and drinks His blood has eternal life. Jesus reveals this truth to us through the Bible, which we can consider as a spiritual microscope. We must accept and believe this truth as it is. No one can deny the phenomenon that is observed when we look under a microscope. However, some people say, the contents in the Bible are only for Christians. It is not relevant to us. As for such people, even if God were to reveal the truth to them, they would still not possess a discernment, judgment, or sense even to understand what they are being shown. Ultimately, even if it is shown to them, they do not acknowledge it. Why? It is because they are spiritually dead. Thus, even if they hear the truth, they deny it. Why is that? Because they are spiritually dead, they lack the necessary discernment. Yet those who partake of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood can understand and believe this truth. The Bible tells us that it is possible to do so because those individuals are children of God. Let's move on to verse 55. In verse 55, Jesus says, For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will what? Live because of me. People who are in a coma or deceased cannot appreciate beautiful music, no matter how enchanting it may be, nor can they compliment breathtaking scenes as being beautiful. Why is that? It is because they are dead. In a lifeless state, they are unable to perceive or experience anything at all. We, therefore, must have life. Then how can we have life? We must eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood. When Christ's flesh and blood exist within us, we receive this title from God. What title is it? We receive the title of My Children from God. In other words, we become God's children who inherit the flesh and blood of God, our spiritual parents. Who is God? Isn't He the King of kings and Lord of lords who reigns over the entire universe? Isn't He the Creator who made the heavens, the earth, and everything in them with His Word? Isn't He the one who divided the Red Sea with His Word and rained down manna from heaven to the Israelites for 40 years? We are indeed the sons and daughters of Almighty God. Our current status on this earth may seem insignificant, following orders from our bosses in our workplaces. However, this is absolutely not our true identity. We are now living in such a way temporarily, while we live in the sinful world as strangers. However, what will happen to us before all the people around the world, once our inherent nature as members of God's family is revealed? We will not only be given praise and honor, but also be the head of all nations, not the tail. It is God who made this promise to us. Today, we inherit God's flesh and blood and become His children. To accomplish this, God has allowed us a regulation called the Passover, through which we can eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood. This Passover is indeed of great importance to the heavenly family. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 17, it is written, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him. The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Up until this time, the Jews had observed the Passover by slaughtering lambs and goats, but Jesus prepared the Passover with bread and wine. Let's move on to verse 26. Verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took, what did he take? Bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is, whose blood is it? My blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The Passover bread represents Christ's holy body, and the Passover wine represents the blood that Christ shed on the cross. He said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What did he say about those who did not partake of his flesh and blood? They have no life. They are considered dead, whereas those who partake in it have eternal life. God has made such a vital distinction between the two. Today we will participate in eating the Passover bread and drinking the Passover wine in accordance with this teaching. This ceremony will be conducted following the ordinance promised by God. 
Those who have the flesh and blood of Christ are members of God's family. Through this, God distinguishes between His children and those who are not, as well as between those who will receive the forgiveness of sins and those who will not. For this reason, what significance did God embed in the Passover wine? What was it that God taught us about His blood? He said, This is my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is extremely important. What will happen to those who do not have the blood of Christ? They can never be part of the heavenly family. They certainly cannot become God's children, nor do they have the right to call God as their Father. Those who observe the Holy Passover of the New Covenant today are confident that God is their Father. It is an undeniable truth. Let us reaffirm this fact by turning to the book of Luke, chapter 22. Let us take a look at the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Let's move on to verse 13. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. Let's see verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, What did he feel about this Passover? I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. What exactly is the Passover that Jesus had eagerly desired to keep it? Knowing that he would be crucified the following day. The Bible records that he prayed earnestly in Gethsemane, being in anguish, and his sweats were like drops of blood falling to the ground. Knowing the time of his suffering was imminent, why then did he desire to keep the Passover so earnestly? To put it simply, for the same reason that we use a litmus test, the Passover contains something very important that separates God's children from those who are not. Jesus said, Whoever eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood has eternal life. Whoever does not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood has no life in them. Jesus already instructed us on how to distinguish between God's children and those who are not. Let's move on to chapter 22, verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Christ granted us the Passover bread as his flesh. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is, what is it? The new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. If the new covenant Passover had not appeared, we would have been at risk of losing our status as God's children in heaven forever. If a child commits an evil deed, their parents may cut them off saying, I will sever all ties with you. They are threatening to nullify the blood relationship that binds them together. That was our situation. However, how did God restore this relationship between us? He restored it through the Passover bread and wine. God opened the way of truth called the New Covenant. Many people in the world regard these teachings of the Bible as absurd. They are akin to someone who claims amoeba and bacteria can only be seen under a microscope. Thus, they do not exist because they are invisible to the naked eye. They are making these kinds of misguided judgments. That is why Jesus declared that such people are spiritually dead. Why can't they discern properly? Why are they unable to make correct judgments? It is because they are dead. What about the living? They believe. Thus, how do they treat the bread and wine, the Passover and the New Covenant? Don't they accept, receive, and believe all the truths? 
The Passover that we keep today is the ultimate truth that reconnects us with God. Through the Passover, we regain our right to be His children. In order to accomplish this, didn't Christ become the reality of the atoning sacrifice that was offered up on the altar of burnt offerings through the long period of 1,500 years in the Old Testament? Reflecting on all these matters, we can see the great significance of blood. For this reason, those who possess God's flesh and blood within them are able to call God Abba, Father. They are the only ones who have this right. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Chapter 10, verse 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in? What do they participate in? The blood of Christ. And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? What is this cup of thanksgiving that participates in Christ's blood and the bread that we break that participates in Christ's body? It is the Passover bread and wine. Is not the Passover wine a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the Passover bread a participation in the body of Christ? Since it starts, is not. It might sound like a negative expression, but that is not the case. This passage explains that we participate in the blood of Christ and the body of Christ through the Passover bread and wine. Let's continue with verse 17. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. Why is that? For we all share the one loaf. Let's move on to verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than He? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible concludes the matter about the Passover. It is not merely about eating a piece of bread and drinking a cup of wine. Christ's holy flesh and His holy blood remains in us. With Christ's flesh and blood within us, from that moment on, we have the privilege as God's children to call God Father and Mother. Would the angels obstruct God's children from passing through the gates of the glorious kingdom of heaven? Princes and princesses can freely enter and exit the palace gates. However, can those who are considered suspicious freely enter and exit the palace gates? Their identities are checked to determine whether they belong to the kingdom or not. What is the ceremony through which we can participate in the body of Christ and His blood? It is the Holy Supper of the Passover with the bread and wine we keep today. This is what Jesus shared with us in Mark's upper room 2,000 years ago. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near. By what have we been brought near? By the blood of Christ. Of course, the blood of Christ encompasses various meanings, such as the sacrifice of Christ and His death. Yet we can say that the family is very dependent on blood. They are related by blood, a family bloodline. This is an extremely important matter. Verse 14, For He Himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in His flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in Himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. Verse 16, 
and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which He put to death their hostility. Let's move on to verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also, what? Members of His household. Those related by blood are now members of God's household. In the New Living Translation, it is expressed as, you are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Then what makes us God's family? Let us be a little more specific. The Bible teaches us that we have become members of God's family through the blood of the truth of the New Covenant Passover. Therefore, we can confidently say that the Passover we are observing today is indeed the most blessed news of hope for all humanity, that is, the Gospel. This news should be made known to all people so that more souls can repent and return to God, not only on the Passover kept in the first month, but also on the second month. When we read 2 Chronicles chapter 30, we can see that King Hezekiah sent couriers throughout northern Israel. What did he proclaim at that time? Return to your God. The Passover is the truth that allows the heavenly children, who sinned in heaven and were cast down to this earth, to fully repent and return to God. Through the Passover, God will indeed grant us blessings on this earth. But what we must hope for is the blessings in the eternal kingdom of heaven. Everything on this earth is transient and fleeting. Since this world is comprised of limited things, nothing within it is eternal. For this reason, people often describe our lives as a brief journey that passes by in the blink of an eye, don't they? In other words, it is not a place where we dwell forever, but rather a temporary layover in which we are merely passing through. Today we have confirmed that we have become members of God's family through the Holy Blood of Christ on the Passover. Two thousand years ago, in Mark's upper room, Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover. We must deeply engrave on our hearts and always remember how earnestly and eagerly Jesus desired to keep the Passover. However, take a look around us. There is no church that keeps the Passover. When you study the history of Christianity, you will find that the Passover was abolished at the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century according to their own decision. Nevertheless, since it is established by God, it must remain true forever. This is because there is a profound significance in it. Through this Passover, we receive the Holy Body and Blood of Christ and become the sons and daughters of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. We have become the heavenly children who are allowed to receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal salvation and to enter the Kingdom of Heaven. With sincere gratitude towards God for His grace, I would like to conclude today's sermon on the Passover. Thank you very much.